Hi, mentalists. So today we're talking about the second part of our discussion on mental causation. And I have made it optional for you to read one of two articles, one by Karen Bennett in Philosophy Compass on mental causation, and the other one by Steve Yablo um, in the Phil Review, I believe, on mental causation. And just to be uh, sort of clear about something, I'm not gonna summarize the entire exclusion problem. So if you would like to go over that, please take a look at the first lecture on mental causation again. So to begin with Karen Bennett's paper, she has many things to say about the, the mental causation problem for substance dualism, a lot of which I discussed last time. So for this particular take on Karen Bennett, I'm gonna focus on her arguments surrounding mental causation as a problem for non-reductive physicalism not as a problem for substance dualism. Um, Bennett is interested in two major questions about mental causation. The first question is, to what extent do any or all of the problems about mental causation depend on a particular view or particular views about the nature of causation? And the second question she's interested in is, to what extent can concerns about the possibility of mental causation be wielded as a weapon against dualism or non-reductive physicalism. Now, I talked about this a little bit last time, but it turns out we don't have one single theory of causation that we all agree about, even that all scientists agree about. And because of that, you might think that one way of getting out of the problem of mental causation is to suggest either that there is no concept of causation, and so there's no problem for mental causation anyway, or to say that uh, any one theory that we give of causation can still account for mental causation, and so it's not a problem that way. Now, both of those responses are really helpful to the substance dualist, but those responses are not going to be quite as attractive to the non-reductive physicalist, because the non-reductive physicalist still wants to be committed, at least according to Kim, to the causal closure principle. Causal closure says that any physical event is best explained by a sufficient physical cause. And that presupposes that we understand what causes are. <laughs> and the non-reductive physicalist generally wants to think that causation is only possible in some sense within the physical realm, because why else be a physicalist as opposed to a substance dualist? Why be a non-reductive physicalist in particular if you don't think that causal closure applies to the physical. It would just start to be really unattractive to end up being a non-reductive physicalist instead of a dualist. So taking the problem of causation seriously, but sort of putting that aside as a potential solution for now for the non-reductive physicalist, what are some of the problems for uh, non-reduction of the mental, right? So if we say that mental properties are distinct from physical properties, We've seen last time that we get Jaguan Kim's exclusion argument. And in order to motivate that a little bit further, I'm gonna talk about what Bennett calls the dilemma of reduction. So suppose that you're the kind of non-reductive physicalist that wants to say that token identities between properties are still possible. Call these local reductions. So local reductions like human pains are C fibers firing, but maybe pain in general isn't exclusively about C fibers firing. Like if you think robots can experience pain, then robot pain won't be the same as C fibers firing, but maybe you think human pain, that's C fibers firing. Call that a local reduction. If you go for local reductions, then you can accommodate the relevance of mental properties to particular occurrences. You can say why, you know, being in pain for humans uh, are, are, is relevant, right, in, in in discussing C fibers firing, why C fibers firing are relevant to talking about pains. But if you say that, you can't make sense of causal generalizations and Keteris paribus laws. So, for example, you can't say that in general pains cause aversive reactions because the causal profile is going to be disjunctive for anything that's a pain, because a pain could be a human pain or it could be a robot pain, and human pain and human and robot pain will be instantiated in different physical ways. So it'll be harder to give a causal generalization of what pains as a whole do. Those local reductions give you local characterizations of causal profiles, 
but the general ones, the more universal property that's supposed to accrue to panes as a whole, um, won't be able to have a generalization. You won't be able to say laws that correspond to all panes, at least not as easily. So multiple realizability seems to want to push you toward local reductions because you, if you're a physicalist, you still want to have those, but then it feels like multiple realizability will leave you unable to make those causal generalizations. That's problem number one. The second problem is that if you resist reduction altogether, if you even don't want local reductions and you go for something like a role functionalist view, right? So functionalism says the type pain is equivalent to whatever fills the role of pain, no matter what it happens to be, it's a kind of description, not, not a rigid designator, right? Um, if you go for role functionalism, then you're a non-reductionist in that sense, you'll have trouble accounting for the causal efficacy of the mental because it results in the exclusion or overdetermination problem. You've got to choose between them. Um, it also results in other problems which we haven't discussed yet, like the causal inheritance problem and the problem of metaphysically necessitated effects. I won't talk about those so much today. Mostly my concern is with the exclusion argument. But the dilemma of reduction basically says, well, if you wanted to go for local reductions, it seems like you can't make causal generalizations and that sounds bad. But if you don't wanna go for local reductions and you wanna go fully non-reductionist, you'll have trouble accounting for the causal efficacy of the mental because you get the exclusion problem. So this is one of the reasons why non-reductive physicalists are quite motivated to respond to the exclusion problem. <laughs> We want to get away from it. We want to be able to say something about why it's not a problem for us if we're non-reductive physicalists. Now, I, I won't summarize the exclusion argument again here. I might just briefly put it up on the screen for you, but please take a look at the previous lecture if you would like a more detailed summary of it. So what Bennett has to say about the exclusion argument to begin with is that she thinks that the exclusion argument is not claiming that mental kinds are not fit for causal work. These are her words. So she thinks it's claiming something more like that there is no job for them to do. So it's not that mental properties or mental events don't have causal powers or like that they couldn't have causal powers or that they're not fit to have causal powers. It's just that they could, but they've got no job to do, right? That's the threat of the exclusion argument. Um, if you take the overdetermination side anyway, it looks like mental events do have causal powers, but they're always swamped out. They're like overridden by whatever the physical causal powers are. And then there's almost no point to talking about them, but not because they, they don't in principle have some ability to cause, if that makes sense. So in order to make the exclusion problem a little bit more tractable for us, I'm gonna put it in the form that Bennett prefers it. And this, this form has five statements that Bennett says form an inconsistent set. So here's statement number one, distinctness. I call this distinctness. Mental properties are distinct from physical properties. And that statement makes sense, right? Because if we're non-reductive physicalists, the target of Kim's argument, then we do think that mental properties are distinct from physical properties. Number two, call this completeness. Every physical occurrence has a sufficient physical cause. So this is just something like causal, causal closure, but it's, it's put in terms of completeness. And Bennett says, if you give up this principle, then you give up the causal completeness of physics and no physicalist really likes this. Although there's not a great reason to convince dualists to accept this particular principle. So this principle is more uncomfortable for non-reductive physicalists than anyone else. Um, because between one and two, that's how you get them kind of started on the problem, if that makes sense. So here's our third statement, call it efficacy. And it says mental events sometimes cause physical ones and sometimes do so in virtue of their mental properties. So that's something that we want to be true if we're not epiphenomenalists. We want to be able to say that mental events sometimes cause physical events, right? And it, sometimes it's because of their mental properties not just because they're physical all the way down, right? If you rejected this principle, then you'd be endorsing epiphenomenalism, or maybe you'd be adopting a kind of dual explanandum strategy, uh, Bennett says. And the, the issue is we 
don't want to do that if we're non-reductive physicalists. Non-reductive physicalists don't want to be epiphenomenalists. Kim places even more pressure on the on the non-reductive physicalist because if you suppose like you're like okay you know what I give up I endorse epiphenomenalism he makes it even worse for you because if you accept epiphenomenalism his supervenience argument uh, basically means that if you're an epiphenomenalist you also have to give up supervenience so you wouldn't be able to be a, an epiphenomenalist and still adopt minimal physicalism basically he's he's making it so that epiphenomenalists are essentially substance dualists. And that's no fun. <laughs> so basically, if you reject efficacy, the pressure to then give up physicalism altogether would get pretty strong, at least if you take the supervenience argument seriously. And remember the supervenience argument, the conclusion of it is that mental to mental causation is possible only if mental to physical causation is. But if you add exclusion, then neither mental to mental causation is possible nor mental to physical causation is possible unless you're an identity theorist. So basically Kim is locking you into a corner where if you wanna be a non-reductive physicalist but you wanna resist the exclusion argument, you have to go not only all the way to epiphenomenalism but all the way to a dualist position, which is also epiphenomenalist. So it's just, it's really bad. Nobody wants to go in that corner. So getting back to Bennett's five inconsistent statements, we get to number four. The fourth one, you can call that non-overdetermination. Non-overdetermination says that effects of mental causes are not systematically overdetermined. So remember, that's one of the options for getting out of the exclusion problem, you know, getting out of the exclusion problem is to say that, that non-overdetermination is false, that maybe the effects of mental causes are always systematically overdetermined by both a mental cause and a physical cause. We don't want to say that, which is why we'd be tempted to adopt non-overdetermination. The fifth of these propositions is called exclusion. Call it exclusion. Exclusion says no effect has more than one sufficient cause unless it is overdetermined. That's sort of like a way of trying to define what we mean by overdetermination is that we're excluding that any effect has more than one sufficient cause unless we're saying that it's a case of over overdetermination so it's drawing a line in the sand right either you're overdetermined or you're not that's the exclusion principle but ba basically bennett thinks that these five statements distinctness completeness efficacy non-overdetermination and exclusion are inconsistent. You can't hold all of them together. You've got to give one up. But I've already given you reasons why giving up one of the first three is not a great idea. You don't want to give up distinctness because then you give up non-reduction. So it's a non-starter for the non-reductionist. You don't want to give up completeness because then you give up the causal completeness of physics and no physicalist really likes that. You don't want to give up efficacy because basically that endorses epiphenomenalism and then if you add the supervenience argument that gets you into full-on dualism so that's bad too so the two that we're left with that we might maybe be able to reject are either non non-overdetermination so if we if we reject that then we'd accept overdetermination or we reject exclusion right um which seems tricky just because it, it's it's more of a definition of what overdetermination is, right? So it feels like really the option that Bennett prefers is to reject non-overdetermination. So Bennett prefers rejecting non-overdetermination as a kind of variant of rejecting exclusion. Effects just do have more than one sufficient cause on her view. Essentially, Bennett suggests that mental causes and physical causes of the same effect are compatible with each other. So the response is to say like, okay, well, we accept overdetermination, over but maybe it's not so bad because these two kinds of causes are related in a way that they're not competing, right? It's not like one or the other, or like both are equally strong or something. It's it, they're, they're, they're compatible in some way. So we need, it would be good to have some way of explaining in what way these overdetermining causes are compatible. And for that, 
we need to turn to Steve Yablo's paper. I just want to note before we turn to Yablo, there are two other major problems that Bennett considers in her paper that are problems for mental causation and how we think about the supervenience of the mental and the physical. One of those is the argument from causal inheritance, which will come up when we talk about Yablo. Um, and I'll, I'll reference it again in a minute. And the second one is the problem of metaphysically necessitated effects, which I brought up in our class discussion. It's the problem that if you define pain, something like pain as being whatever first order property plays the pain role, and that involves in itself having a particular causal profile, then it feels like that you're including <laughs> sort of in the definition of the mental state, what its causal profile is supposed to be. So you get a kind of circularity there. The thing that causes my aversive reaction is a property that causes aversive reactions. So there's, anyway, there's a problem there for functionalists and non-reductive physicalists, but especially for functionalists. I won't go over that one, but feel free to look at the notes that I have for Karen Bennett that are up on, in our class folder or to just reread that part of Bennett and see if maybe um, that helps clarify some of those questions that you might have about that section. Um, for what it's worth, Ned Block thinks that this is a variant of the exclusion problem. So talking about the exclusion problem might help out with this problem of met metaphysically necessitated effects. It also might not. That depends on whether Block is right um, and Bennett's characterization of, of the problem is right. Um, but again, I don't want to spend too long on that. All right, so I was trying to sell Steve Yablo's paper on mental causation as a way to make sense of how accepting that overdetermination might be the best way out of the exclusion problem doesn't sound as bad if you think about it. <laughs> how do we make it sound more appealing to say that we're kind of accepting determina uh, overdetermination? What's going to be important is understanding Yablo's notions of determinate and de determinable properties. And I'll get into that in a moment. But basically, Diablo's paper is going to make a case for mental causation in light of the problems that mental causation faces from epiphenomenalism and from the exclusion problem. And the main three themes that are present throughout his paper are the relationship between this determinate and de determinable, the question of whether mental phenomena are determinables of physical phenomena. And finally, the assertion that since a determinant cannot preempt its own determinable, mental events and properties are not causally irrelevant to their physical realizations. So basically he's gonna explain what is the relationship between mental and physical properties such that it's, they're not in competition with each other when they cause things in the world. And this relationship that they have Yablo thinks is the relationship between a determinable property and a determinate property. So before we define those terms, here's, here's a couple of key uh, definitions. First of all, a definition of the identity of properties or necessary coextensiveness. This is on page 251 of the Yablo. The identity of properties says that P equals Q or P is identical to Q only if necessarily for all X, X has P if and only if X has Q. So P equals Q only if for all objects X, an object has P if and only if it has Q. So if an object has P, it'll have Q as long as P is identical to Q. And that's an identity property. Sorry, that's an identity between those properties P and Q. Now, here's the other term that's important. I call this determination. Determination says that P determines Q. P determines Q only if, first of all, necessarily for all objects X, if X has P, then X has Q. And secondly, possibly for some objects X, X has Q but lacks P. The main thing to notice here is that the property of determination is different from the, uh, the property of identity. That's what these definitions help us establish, that they're non-equivalent. 
So those are the formal definitions, but really what's, what's helpful for understanding the determinant and determinable relation is to think about some examples. And then I'll give you a definition of each of these terms as well. So think about the color spectrum, right? We categorize the color spectrum using color concepts like red, right? But actually the category of things that are red includes many different specific colors that are subsets of that larger category red. Colors like scarlet or brick red or crimson, right? So Diablo wants to say that crimson is related to red as a determinant of red. So red, the larger kind of category property, the property of redness is a determinable. It's a, it's a type of category, which in a particular instance might be represented by a particular determinant. So if you have a case of something that's crimson, because it's a determinant of red, you also have an instance of red. You have an instance of red in a sense because you have an instance of crimson. But what matters is that crimson is a specific subset of this property. So the determinable property is something that can be determined by instantiating as one of its determinants, if that makes sense. So you have red by having one of its determinants. Here's another example. Squares are determinants of rectangles. Some of the specific ways of being rectangles are ways of being squares. And that's why being a square is a way of being a rectangle. So being a square is a determinant form of the determinable Rectangles, there's many ways to be rectangles. One of those ways determinately is a square. So just to anticipate Yablo's response to the exclusion problem, he is going to say that physical and mental properties are re related in that relationship in the same relationship as red and crimson are related. So for him, mental properties are to physical realizations as rectangles are to squares or as red is to crimson. So the physical property is a determinant of the mental property. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about multiple realization, which is one of the commitments of non-reductive physicalists, right? You can instantiate pain in many physical ways. So that means that just like you can instantiate a, squid, a rectangle, in many different ways with different shapes, including squares, you can instantiate pains in many different ways, including neural events or robot events, okay, whatever those are. So the physical state that realizes the pain state is a determinant of the pain state. So the pain state or the mental property or the mental event is a determinable. It's something that can be further specified as a physical thing that is the determinant of that property. Now that view sounds really appealing, but if the exclusion argument holds, this is what Yablo is worried about, then determinable properties, even determinable properties like red are causally impotent. The only thing that explains why red has any causal effect on us say as beings that see red is that that determinant version of that red property. So only scarlet, that specific kind of red that we see is the thing that actually has causal powers if the exclusion argument is correct. Because you should always, in one way of understanding the exclusion argument, you should always prefer the more fundamental level of explanation for causation. Or if you have two levels, then you have overdetermination, and it just looks like the one that's uh, supervenient is not going to be doing very much work. And in this case, the determinable property is supervenient in a sense on its determinants. And so it looks like, in this case, red isn't doing any causal work, only the scarlet is. So to give you a specific example, suppose that I've trained a pigeon to peck at red triangles. And every time that it pecks, I give it a treat or something. And so it pecks at this particular red triangle that is a scarlet triangle. What explains the pecking 
you might think is that a particular wavelength of light arrived in the pigeon's retina and caused it to peck. It's that particular wavelength that has the causal powers, not the general category of red. The ca general category of red isn't there. What's there is the determinant of that property. And that determinant is the thing that explains in this particular instance, the bird's pecking uh, behavior. So that looks bad, right? So the determinant determinable relationship doesn't get you out of exclusion right away. But let's get into Yablo's anti-exclusion argument. I call this his anti-exclusion argument from determinate and determinable properties. So in section four of his paper, Yablo notes that exclusion turns out to apply even to things like barely violent earthquakes versus violent earthquakes, right? So there's lots of ways to be a violent earthquake. The Richter scale has a few different numbers and a few different decimals that you can apply to in indicate the magnitude of an earthquake. A violent earthquake can be instantiated by a number of those numbers. There's a few different ways to be a violent earthquake. So you could be a barely violent earthquake or you could be a very violent earthquake. So the exclusion argument is gonna say that what explains the building falling down isn't that there was a violent earthquake, it's that there was a barely violent earthquake. And that sounds a little weird, right? Surely that's not what explains the building falling down. It's, it sounds like you, we wanna say that it's the determinable that explains the building falling down. But the exclusion argument would force us on Yablo's view to say that it's the barely violentness of the earthquake that's actually causally efficacious. Sounds strange. But Yablo thinks what that is doing is that it's making us notice that some properties are maybe irrelevant to causation. He thinks even ultimate determinants, so if, right, determinant and determinable is a relationship that's relative to a particular level of analysis. You could go higher up on the scale of categorization or lower down on the scale of categorization. So if you went down to the most specific way you could account for a determinant, the ultimate determinant, call that. So that will only determine one determinable if you're at that level, right? Uh, because that's how you know that you're unamenable to further determination. Even on the traditional view, that might be seen as causally powerless, Diablo thinks, because these ultimate determinants are likely to have some irrelevant quality that abstracted away leaves a determinable that is itself sufficient to cause the effect. So just like we think that it's irrelevant that the violent earthquake was barely violent for explaining that the building fell down, if we go all the way to even the ultimate level, we'll find cases where something about being super, super determinate is just super, super irrelevant to what happened. It doesn't matter that like one of the atoms in the baseball was like a little bit more off this way. One of the times that I threw the baseball, right? If both of the times that I threw the baseball, it broke a window. The explanation of why the window broke is that I threw a baseball at it, not that I threw a baseball at it and that there was one atom that was like slightly this way. But that there was one atom that was slightly this way is more determinate than that there's a baseball, <laughs> right? So basically, if we go all the way to the bottom level, it feels like we'll find properties that are causally irrelevant all over the place. And that doesn't look good either. So the exclusion argument must have something wrong with it, Diablo thinks. So he thinks that we actually need a reconstruction of the exclusion principle itself to accommodate the question of whether there's a metaphysical difference between what must cause something and what can cause or is causing something. He thinks it'll turn out that the exclusion problem won't affect determinants and determinables, determinants and determinables anyway. So I'll put a summary of this argument here for a moment in case you want to look at it in more detail um, on your own time. But basically the place we come to is that Yablo thinks that on the basis of his argument, exclusion is not a good principle and it shouldn't be applied to the mind-body case because it shouldn't be applied outside of the mind-body case either. So it's not a problem that's specific to the mind-body problem. And so the, you know, Kim can't accuse us of being like ad hoc 
in our response to the exclusion problem. We're not saying that there's something special about mental properties that means that in this case, overdetermination is fine. No, we're saying that this is a generalizable principle. This determinate determinal relation exists all over metaphysically and the exclusion problem would arise therefore all over metaphysically. And that's one thing that indicates that maybe we should abandon the exclusion principle, Diablo thinks. And now I'm here to ask you whether at this point that sounds like the right thing to say. What do you think about whether physical ways of being are determinants of mental properties? And what do you think about whether the determinate determinable relation helps explain why it's fine to talk about the causal powers of determinables like mental properties, even though they're not the most specific versions of themselves? How does this jive with your idea of fundamentality, for example? Do you still have the intuition that what's more fundamental is what genuinely causes? Or do you find this Diablo argument appealing and now you think, oh, it actually turns out that there's many levels of analysis of causation and causation is just something that explains stuff happening. It's not about things happening at a particular level. That's kind of one of the implications of Yablo's argument that we might be able to draw out. So Yablo has a section in his paper, actually a couple sections in his paper that I'm gonna skip over, um, but they're in your notes in case you wanna look at them. And the main conclusion of these sections is that uh, th Yablo thinks that it might be necessary to define what essential properties are in order to make sense of the determinate and determin determinable relation. He talks about what essential properties are gonna be. And he also says that on his view, no physical event has essential mental properties. So no physical thing is essentially mental. This just follows from uh, some considerations about what he thinks is essential to mental properties and to physical properties. Um, so you can take, take a look at that stuff if you want to. Um, now, another thing that he says that might be interesting to us is that he thinks that we have to suggest that mental events are physically impoverished, as opposed to saying that physical events are mentally impoverished. So mental events are physically impoverished because they need to, they can only exist with a physical instantiation. Um, but even though they can only exist with a physical instantiation, the, the physical instantiation itself, the property that instantiates it won't always necessitate the mental property, if that makes sense. So basically multiple realizability together with asymmetrical necessitation means that necessarily something has a mental property if and only if it also has a physical determination of that mental property. So in order to be a mental property, it's got to have physical properties. So it's it's kind of like an even stronger physicalism that we get out of this discussion from Yablo, which is interesting um, because even though he thinks that uh, physical events are not essentially mental, um, it turns out that you can't have mental properties without physical events. Now, getting back to the exclusion problem, Suppose that you're, you're still worried, and at this point, Yablo is still a little worried that maybe mental events have become causally irrelevant um, with the help of some of the arguments that he's been engaged with previously in his paper and still considering the exclusion principle. Um, so are mental events causally irrelevant? Are they only relevant insofar as they are physical, right? Because if you only have a mental property, if you have a physical property, then not only is there this asymmetrical necessitation, so mental properties are not as fundamental or something like that as physical properties. Now it also turns out that the physical properties are sufficient for explaining physical causes, right? If we accept causal closure. So what are the mental properties even doing? The determinate and determinable relation as specified so far doesn't get us to the point where we say, oh, actually mental properties have like a robust causal role. So far we've only gotten to the point where like, oh, well they don't compete. It's not a problem that there's two causes happening, right? So in the last section, Yablo is actually going to argue that the mental has an even better chance of playing the causal role when mental stuff causes physical stuff than physical stuff itself. Why is that? Well, even though the mental phenomena 
that occur depend on their physical basis for their causal sufficiency, right? For their ability to have causal powers. Diablo thinks that the competition between determinables and determinates is not one for causal influence. It's not one for like, which of us is really doing the thing. Instead, um, it's not one for like whether or not they have causal powers, but instead it's a competition for the role of the cause, which one gets to be called like the main explanation for what happened, as opposed to whether both are components in what happened. Both are components in what happened. So that's the part where we say, oh, there's some overdetermination here. But what is important is deciding which one is actually the definitive explanation. And Yablo actually thinks that the better definitive explanation for what happens when mental causation happens is the mental property. So if I want a glass of water and I go down to the kitchen to get water, the explanation of that that makes for a better explanation is that I wanted the water. The mental property is a better explanation of my going to the kitchen than whatever was going on neurochemically. Let me use an example from Yablo. So consider the death of Socrates. So Socrates died because he was ruled to be a nuisance to, <laughs> to the city and um, they were gonna execute him by making him drink hemlock. Now Socrates died because he drank hemlock. And Yablo points out that he would have died because he drank the hemlock regardless of whether he drank the hemlock by sipping it, which is a determinate way of drinking the hemlock, or by guzzling it, which is another determinate way of drinking the hemlock. The better explanation of why he died is that he drank the hemlock, not the kind of irrelevant specific way in which he drank the hemlock. If the, er it, the now irrelevant specific way in which he drank the hemlock had made a difference in whether or not he was going to die, then maybe that would be the better uh, filler for the role of the cause, right? If actually drinking hemlock slowly didn't kill you, but guzzling hemlock did kill you, then what would have explained Socrates dying is his guzzling the hemlock. But it wasn't the difference maker. The difference maker in this case is his drinking the hemlock, not his guzzling the hemlock. In the same way, Job wants to say that the difference maker, when we're talking about events that have mental causes, is the mental property or the mental event that occurred. That's the thing that makes it be the case that the effect is to be expected more so than whether, you know, that belief or that desire was caused by a very specific way of being that belief or that desire. So in conclusion, Steve Yablo actually thinks that mental events can be more suited than physical events for being a causal role. So in summary, um, between Bennett and Yablo, we've seen a response to the exclusion problem that basically says, all right, well, what if we accept the horn of the dilemma that says that we're either epiphenomenalists or we have to accept overdetermination? Why don't we just accept overdetermination? But instead of like bowing out after that, we say that it's not a problem for us to talk about multiple potential causes of something. Maybe what's really going on is that some causal influences are better explanations of things occurring and the better explanations of things occurring give them a particular role that we call like kind of the causal role. And that has to do with what is the thing that makes a difference? What is the thing that actually generates a good explanation for what occurred reliably across variations in the circumstances? For Yablo, that actually means that the mental property is going to come out ahead of the physical property more often than not, which doesn't require us saying that mental properties are not ultimately part of the physical world. So what do you think about that? Uh, do you think this argument makes sense? Are there any problems with some of the assumptions that it makes? Or is this like extremely helpful and a balm on your soul? and helps us move on from the causal exclusion problem. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye.